Rules Committee to come to order, and thank you very much for joining us. Another fun day uh, at the Rules Committee. Uh, Judge, we said we'd be here at 3 o'clock, and we made it. Uh, and we're having a lot of fun. Today, the committee will be considering the Senate Amendment to H.R. 1370 stopgap legislation that will temporarily extend federal funding until January the 19th, 2018. This legislation fully funds national defense program for the entire fiscal year with a total of $664 billion for the Department of Defense. This includes important emergency funding for missile defense activities. And as we all know, our troops and commanders must have the resources that they need in especially uncertain times, and especially at a time of the holidays. This legislation will allow them to continue to advance peace with the resolve of superior firepower and professionalism across the globe. The legislation reauthorizes and extends funding for the CHIP program for five years, something that is very important to me, not only uh, being from Dallas, Texas, but as an advocate for children and those especially with disabilities. It also extends funding for community health centers and several other public health programs through 2019. The measure also provides more Medicaid funding for Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands. I note also that we have the gentleman who I will be asking to give a full update at any time on this issue from the uh, gentleman from the Energy and Commerce Committee, the Vice Chairman of Health a Subcommittee, who has been at the epicenter of this issue. And I want to thank Dr. Michael Burgess for his work with uh, the young Chairman Friedling Heisen on this issue. Additionally, I would like to thank Chairman Friedley has it for his work on behalf of all those affected by the devastating storms earlier this year, including Hurricane Harvey in my home state of Texas. Certainly we have those that are from Florida, the islands, uh, Louisiana, and other coastal communities that felt the brunt of this terrible storm. The text of the disaster supplemental has been posted on the Rules Committee website, and while there's still ongoing discussions on the best way to get the bill exact, uh, enacted into law quickly, I would ask the chairman, since he is here, uh, along with his uh, great ranking member, to go through that product, giving us an idea. So without ex uh, objection, I'd like to welcome the young chairman from uh, New Jersey. Uh, excuse me, uh, Pete, you're here in place of Nita Lowy. I assumed you were a subcommittee chairman of the piece part of what primarily we're going to handle today. Uh, I miss Nita, but uh, you're, you're more than able to uh, stand in her stead and, and give us that full update. I figured the chairman needed help too, so I know how this goes. Uh, so we're delighted to have both of you here at the Rules Committee to discuss this legislation without objection anything you both brought in writing. We have our awesome stenographer here who will want to get the um, transcript correctly, and so anything you leave for her will be a benefit. Before we move to you, Mr. Chairman, uh, I would like to defer to the gentleman, uh, the ranking member of the committee, for any opening statement he'd like to make. Gentlemen's recognized. Well, I'll just be very brief. I want to welcome our witnesses. It's always great to see you. Um, but with regard to um, what you're here to present to the committee, um, uh, it's a little bit frustrating. I think we all know uh, that this is not a serious attempt at uh, keeping our government open and running. Uh, we all know um, that this is dead on arrival in the, in the United States Senate. And I'd like to ask unanimous consent to insert in the record a letter that was sent to Speaker Ryan and, um, and, and Leader McConnell on December 12th, signed by every Democrat in the Senate, which says they're not going to support a bill that basically, um, you know, provides a, a special treatment for the defense budget at the expense of every other budget. Without objection, um, in the record. And. Um, you know, this is not a serious fix for CHIP. Um, we've been talking about this for a long, long time. Um, I think we need uh, to, uh, the offsets are, are, are unacceptable. But it is, uh, it is frustrating because we're coming to the end. Um, I think we're coming to the end. Maybe we, we're not. Um, and, um, and one would like to think all this would have been worked out by now. Um, and, um, and instead, you know, what we see uh, within the House is that the right wing is having a fight with the extreme right wing, and we are moving this, uh, this bill forward, which we know is going nowhere, and we will just have to wait to see what the, what the Senate does. But, um, but, you know, 
I, I would just say to my, my friends, you know, it'd be better if we just, you know, behaved like grown-ups and worked out a deal um, and kept the government running um, and, uh, you know, didn't just have a special carve out for the defense budget, but de dealt with everything. And, um, and I think that would have been what we, that, that's what I would, I had hoped we would be dealing with today, but uh, apparently we're not. And, um, and again, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I will we'll go through this charade and um, it'll go nowhere in the Senate and we're just going to have to wait to see what the Senate does and, and, uh, and then we'll meet again and, and figure it out. But, but I would say to my colleagues, I mean, you all should be happy today. I mean, you, you got what you wanted uh, in this tax bill. I mean, this corporate tax bill that all, all your donors should be happy. I mean, everybody, you know, all the people who are well off and well connected are happy. And um, so I think, you know, you have enough cover with your base uh, to actually do the right thing on keeping the government running. Um, and we can then move on. So with that, uh, Mr. Chairman, again, I, you know, let's go through the charade and um, and hopefully we'll get to the point where we actually could do something meaningful. Are you back? Thank you very much. Um, Mrs. Slaughter is now here. I don't know whether you want yeah. to take time. We're doing the CR yeah. through through yeah. this, uh, January 9th, till January 19th. I understand that, as well as the defense bill, correct? To finalize that piece for the year. Um, Ms. Brown is not here. I, I met with her to, for about 10 minutes. Do you think there's a chance that we could help her? Let me give the story is uh, one of a, a constituent of Julie Brownlee's was a Vietnam veteran. Uh, and he uh, was seriously wounded. Right at this point, he's dying of cancer. It's pretty imminent. And Secretary Mattis had looked into the case and wrote to Julia. When I had a copy of the letter about it. <laughs> that he believes, as Secretary Mattis, he believes that he is entitled to the Congressional Medal of Honor. Uh, if we could get copies made and everybody could see that, it would be good. Uh, and because it's imminent, I just was hoping, I understand we're not gonna make amendments in order or anything, but uh, as an act of mercy and kindness at Christmas time, if, if we could help that by making that in order in the defense bill and the manager's amendment or some possible way, if there is one? Uh, that's a good question. Mm -hmm. uh, I want you to know that I learned about this 10 minutes Me ago. Me too. I was about a half hour. And ago, with yeah. great respect to the gentleman and his service to our country right. during Vietnam, mm -hmm. and the congresswoman came up and we met for a few <coughs> minutes, and I have told her that I will be very pleased to look very diligently at it and will be very pleased to tell you uh, when we get out of here, we're going to go for votes in a few minutes, of uh, the substance of what I'm trying right. to learn more about. Well, I would like all of you to have a copy of the letter yes, from, from General Mattis, um, because if anybody could judge the fitness of this medal, it, it would be him. And I, I just was hoping there might be some way uh, it's simply as an act of, of mercy because his family is uh, very keen on his having this. And, and as Julia let me know that, that his death is, is very close and very near. They should like to know that. So uh, here's one for you. Thank you very much. Okay. Mm. Anything further? Not yet. Uh, we're coming back up, I guess, after the vote. We, we will come back right. up and finalize. We're going to try and get as far as we can now, All and then right. we're going to move on. You notice that Pete's here to uh, offer uh, a vision for your party and came up. And Rod Pete's my buddy. Up. Yes? Yep. Oh, I thought he was my buddy, too. Well, probably. So, <laughs> so we're delighted to have you. But I, I went to Indiana with him once. Have you done that? He's not invited me yet. Oh, okay. But... But uh, we'll, we'll make sure we're going to continue now, so. Yeah. Well, they're both very hardworking, yeah. and I'm very fond of both of them. Yeah. Gentlemen. Uh, Mr. Well, Freelinghausen in particular. Gentlemen, thank you for joining us here at the Rules Committee. What we do here is serious work, and there uh, have been some assertions that this is not me. serious. In fact, it is. Okay. And I want you to know that I do respect 
the United States Senate. I respect them as co-equals, uh, that their, their work is as important as our work, but our work is as important as their work. And the bottom line is, is that any uh, indication that we have that we could not make a determination before we go into a two-week uh, delay uh, of Christmas break to take care of the men and women of this country uh, and to not put them on a short time frame is vitally important to me. And so I am delighted. We'll, part of the debate will take place today. You'll receive our feedback. But I'm delighted that with the mark that the young chairman has brought to us, with that said, the gentleman, the go-to guy from New Jersey is recognized. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Slaughter and members, thanks for having Pete Fiskolowski and I here this afternoon. It's a pleasure to be back and uh, to testify on the House Amendment to Senate Amendment H.R. 1370. This legislation provides critical funding for national defense, prevents a government shutdown, and extends the Children's Health Insurance Program and other pro vital programs. In addition, I'm also here to present the emergency funding legislation, totaling $81 billion to help Americans across the Gulf Coast, Caribbean, and the West recover from multiple devastating disasters. I'm here to seek an appropriate rule to provide for prompt consideration of this necessary legislation. Because the current government funding mechanism expires Friday, it's critical that the House act now. This legislation is a simple, clean extension of the funding level at the levels at the current fiscal year 2017 rate until January 19th, 2018. This deadline extension will allow leadership time to complete its negotiations on our top line spending levels and the Appropriations Committee to complete its integral work on all 12 appropriations bills. In the meantime, it's essential that Congress maintain the government programs and services that all Americans depend on. The legislation also waives the automatic cuts to defense spending for fiscal year 2018 that could harm our national defense and temporarily delays the automatic cuts to non-defense funding due to take place in January as a result of sequestration. National security is a chief priority for us. In addition to stopping these cuts, the bill contains the full year Department of Defense funding for 2018 fiscal year as passed twice by the House. This funding will ensure our troops have the resources they need to be ready to fight now and to advance peace in our missions around the world. On top of this funding, the bill also contains $59.9 billion in emergency and overseas contingency operations funding as requested to bolster missile defense, replace damaged Navy ships, and provide resources for the troop surge in Afghanistan. In total, the bill provides $663.8 billion in base, OCO, and emergency funding for the Department of Defense. This bill also includes $2.1 billion in mandatory funding for the VA Choice Program to ensure our veterans continue to receive the health care they need and have earned. In addition to this critical funding, the bill extends the National Flood Insurance Program through January 19th of next year. The legislation all includes the full text of H.R. 3922, the Championing of Healthy Kids Bill, which extends funding for the Children's Health Insurance Program, federally qualified health centers, and other important health programs. This will ensure that 9 million children for low-income families receive important health coverage. While I understand there are, are ongoing conversations on how to proceed on the supplemental, I never the last would like to present to you our supplemental, emergency supplemental legislation, the third tranche of much needed funding to support ongoing recoveries following multiple hurricanes and wildfires that have devastated our nation and caused the loss of life and much property. In fact, this year's back-to-back -back hurricanes are three of the top five most expensive hurricanes in the last 25 years. This Congress is committed to helping people, communities, and businesses that are in the midst of major rebuilding efforts in Texas, Florida, California, Louisiana, Puerto Rico, and the U.S. Virgin Islands. This legislation is the next step in their recovery and provides $81 billion to crucial federal programs that support this process. 
This includes $27.5 billion for FEMA, $26.1 billion for the Community Development Block Grants, Disaster Recovery, and $12.1 billion for the Army Corps of Engineers. It also includes $3.8 billion for the Department of Agriculture, relates to crop loss and livestock loss, will support, as it says, assistance for these uh, two communities. Provisions also are, are included to allow the transfer of up to $4 billion in disaster assistance direct loan programs for community disaster loans, what they call CDLs, and to provide up to 90% federal cost tier for disasters declared in the 2000s, uh, this year's, for wild, wildfires. Fires. We also include funding repair of federal highways and local transit to help children displace because of hurricanes in Puerto Rico get back to school wherever they've come, come from. And mo they've come out of Puerto Rico. And for small business disaster loans, Congress has already provided $51.75 billion for these ongoing efforts. And as we move forward, we'll continue to monitor recovery efforts and require accountability for every dollar spent on recovery. We also stand with our, also f with our fellow Americans to ensure that they have what they need to rebuild their livelihoods uh, and, and, leave their, and leave their lives. I thank the committee for your time and urge support of the legislation on the House floor. Deal thank back. you, Mr. Chairman. Now my good friend from the great state of Indiana, the ranking member on the Defense Subcommittee on the Appropriations Committee is recognized. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. As was mentioned, I am here instead of Ms. Lowy, who was detained. Uh, would ask unanimous consent to have her statement entered into the record. Without objection. Would also ask unanimous consent to have my statement entered into the record. Without objection. And would make a few brief comments. One, I do believe that the chairman ably describes the legislation before us and that will be on the floor tomorrow. And I would just make an observation or two. Despite the best efforts of Chairman Freelingheisen, uh, Representative Lowy, Chairwoman Granger, the other members of the Appropriations Committee and our staff, we are now late, nearly three months into the fiscal year in a realistic path towards enactment of the 12 fiscal year 2018 bills has not emerged. Mr. McGovern uh, mentioned uh, earlier that we're coming to an end. Uh, I was stated a bit differently. The end of the last fiscal year was September 30th. And in all likelihood, as the sun sets on the first session of the 115th Congress, the federal government will be operating under its third short-term continuing resolution. Uh, it is my sincere hope that however long the next CR lasts, that it will allow for a budget agreement that provides this committee with the opportunity to write a thoughtful, comprehensive, and effective omnibus bill under the chairman and Ms. Lowy's leadership, the sooner Congress carries out its most basic responsibility of funding the federal government, the better off this country will be. Every day we operate our country under a CR is a day wasted. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, let me begin first by acknowledging the obvious. These are two of my favorite members. <laughs> One of them is my chairman of uh, my major committee, and the other one's a valued friend and colleague and, and leader on the other side. And uh, I want to reinforce both your opening remarks. Um, I, I share the frustration that I know, Mr. Chairman, you feel because all your bills were ready on time, and we've been waiting almost 100 days for the Senate to pass a single bill and for an agreement. Uh, and and I, uh, I cast no partisan aspersions in this, but uh, the President, the majority leader in the Senate, the Speaker of the House, and the two minority leaders in their respective chambers have got to give us a number. Uh, you know, what we've demonstrated for three, uh, three consecutive times, we know how to get this done, but this could have been done a lot sooner and a lot more orderly uh, process, and both of you have been advocates for that following regular order, and both of you have done it in your committee, and both of you have worked across the aisle to find compromises. We know there's going to be disagreements, and... Uh, we also know that the appropriations process in the end has to be a bipartisan process. It just simply doesn't work any other way. Uh, so uh, uh, you've, you've commendably done that throughout your careers. And so where we're at today certainly doesn't reflect you or the committee. Uh, it reflects the inability of people above us to come to an agreement. Uh, and uh, I regret that. I think I regret it under President Obama. I regret it under President Trump. It's not good. Um, Mr. Chairman, I just have a couple of quick questions, and uh, 
I want to also commend you for the supplemental. Uh, you know, I think a lot of people don't know. We had a full discussion about this today. Uh, obviously, the administration submitted $44 billion. If we looked at the requests from the affected areas, I think you reported that they were like $193 billion. Um, I don't know what the right number is, but I know these numbers were scrubbed. We had multiple hearings. You worked with the members from the affected states on both sides of the aisle. Uh, and tried to come up with what's a reasonable number here. And one thing I will be proud of Congress for is that on this question, we have demonstrated twice, and I think we'll eventually demonstrate a third time, that we've worked together across the aisle to make sure that our fellow Americans uh, in Texas and Louisiana and Florida and Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands, uh, you know, and any other affected areas, and our friends in California who have a different kind of challenge are getting the help they need in a timely fashion, and uh, that's a good thing. Uh, but uh, I always point out, you've already produced a budget for this year in April. You've produced two and now a third supplemental. Uh, and uh, we may disagree with how we proceed, but I, I think it's a fair thing for the House to send to the Senate its best product. And I think that's what you've done here. And the Senate is free to send back something different, and I suspect they will. Uh, the one thing I would hope is that uh, uh, we simply do not leave town until the government is funded for an agreed-upon period by the, the top leaders in uh, our respective parties and the president, and that uh, this supplemental is done uh, so that the people don't have to worry over Christmas in uh, Texas and Florida and Louisiana and, again, the, the uh, uh, Puerto Rican and Virgin Islands, uh, that, that there, there's any chance that the help they need is not forthcoming. This committee's done its job in that regard. And, uh, and I'm confident in the end we'll find, uh, you know, there may be some maneuvers or whatever, but I think at the end of the day we'll, we'll work across the aisle and we'll work across the rotunda and we'll get there. But you guys have really set the example this year. Um, on the defense portion, uh, and I know there's some controversy about that, to me, uh, and I'm just speaking for myself, the, the bill that uh, was crafted in the House Armed Services Committee and the funding that both of you have worked on as a former chairman of the Subcommittee on Defense and the current ranking member uh, pretty much mirrors what the Senate did. So I don't see any reason why there should be any holdup there. Uh, we're going to fund the rest of government. And I think uh, a year-long CR is not good for anybody. So um, um, I would like to get that out of the way, but I, again, I recognize my friend from Massachusetts mentioned that, and uh, accurately so, that uh, senators and the Democrats and the Senate have a different point of view, and they have a vote. They have a right to pursue what they think is in their interest and appropriate things. So I don't think these things are insoluble, but uh, I do know this. Uh, we can't go through another round of sequester on January 22nd. We need to get that top-line number. If you get if the leaders in Congress and uh, the administration will get the number, I have every confidence that you and Ms. Loy and uh, our colleagues on the other side of the aisle and uh, your subcommittee chairman on your side, Mr. Chairman, will deliver. They will get it done and uh, bring it home. And I, frankly, I don't think we ought to go home until we reach those kind of agreements. I don't like playing fast and loose with government shutdowns. It's always a mistake. Uh, there wasn't really a question there, but I want to give you each a chance to respond and make any point you care to make. But I'm very comfortable with the product you're presenting, Mr. Chairman. Well, we, we did our appropriations bills uh, 100 days ago, and, and uh, certainly we need to need the, meet the needs of uh, Texans, uh, Floridians, uh, our fellow citizens, Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands, and, 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 and things are still bad in California. I don't think those fires are out. So I, I think we've put together a package. Uh, you know because you chaired one of the eight hearings that the hearings are bipartisan. We had people step forward to uh, tell us the needs of their agencies to meet these ongoing situations, people in pretty desperate straits. So I feel pretty good about the package. I hope when it gets over to the Senate that they will feel similarly that we need to do something before we leave town here, keep the government open for business, and meet the needs of the, these uh, people who victimized by both hurricanes and wildfires. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I would simply uh, state uh, my belief that the defense portion of this bill is an excellent product. Uh, Chairwoman Granger, all of the members on the committee and the subcommittee did an excellent job given the number they were given. I do believe our constitutional responsibility 
is to make sure that the department spends it wisely and effectively because it's a big add from last year. Having said that, given the vote that we have had today in this body, I am very concerned about how the other 11 bills that we are charged to report and pass will look, given a certain class of our colleagues' argument that now we have no revenue and now we have an increased <coughs> deficit. If I cannot pass a written exam, I cannot join the Marine Corps and defend this country. If I am in ill health, I cannot join the United States Navy and help defend this country. Chairwoman Granger and I had a briefing very sobering this morning on some critical technological issues. If we don't make an investment as a nation in that cutting edge technology, we are going to be overtaken by some very serious allies, uh, uh, adversaries. And I am concerned that if we do not do these 12 bills holistically, we run a risk to the national defense of our country because of that human infrastructure that would be left behind. Well, I certainly don't disagree with my friend in anything that he has to say. And uh, I think I know my chairman would like to get all of these things done because he sees, <laughs> as, you, as my friend does, the interrelationship. Yes, sir. Mr. Chairman, I, I don't want to whine all afternoon. <laughs> But I have had it with continuing resolutions, and we are wasting more money and more time of people at the Department of Defense, at the Department of Energy, at the Department of Education by not telling them at the start of the year, for good or bad, here is what you have. Go effectively do your job. We are going to spill into next year. We were in May this year. We will tell them three or four different times what their spending level. It is wrong. And again, I am sincere in hoping that during this next time period that, as you suggest, and I absolutely agree with you, let us come to a thoughtful agreement on a number and let this gentleman, Ms. Lowe, and everybody else get this job done and do it on time. Couldn't agree more. Last point I care to make, and then I'd go to my friend from Georgia and next, I believe, my friend from New York. But uh, uh, when we deal with the disaster portion of this, it's, a, it's good to remember, and Mr. Chairman, I want to compliment you on this, that disaster reaches beyond the affected areas. We have a lot of displaced people. I was talking to our friend, Mr. Dent, from Pennsylvania. The school districts he represents have about 1,000 displaced children in there. They have a large Puerto Rican population, and a lot of those folks obviously move to an area where they've got family ties and what have you. And so uh, one of the things I like in this bill is that we have money set aside to help these folks that are, you know, out of the goodness of them, their heart, helping their fellow Americans in difficult situations. And uh, so while most of this money is going to be directed, as it should be, toward the immediate areas, we recognize there's ripples that reach out beyond those and that impact other communities, and we're trying to be helpful there. And you're very far-sighted to include that. And that, uh, let me go with my good friend from Georgia for any. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank you both for, for being here. I wanted to ask the gentleman from Indiana. Sometimes we find ourselves in echo chambers around uh, here, and we often, uh, in the Republican conference, uh, talk about that full year of DOD funding. And, and notwithstanding the accuracy of what you said, we're losing money and effectiveness at, at DOE as it relates to energy, at DOE as it relates to education, and at ag, you go right on through the agencies. Uh, it's, it's bad public policy, period, to be operating on CRs. But we talk about it in the Republican conference as if there's something partic particularly pernicious happening at DOD when folks cannot uh, uh, stray from the last year's funding model. As the, as the resident expert, uh, on that, uh, it, it, is that part of the of of a of, of, a, of an echo chamber? Or is there something different that is worth talking about? Finding an agreement on a full year of DoD funding, even if we have not yet been able to find an agreement on a full year of DOE uh, or uh, or I, ag funding. I would respond to the gentleman by saying, for every agency of the government, the budget for fiscal year 2019 is going to be presented to this body, the House and Senate the first week in February. That is about 40 days or less after we return from the holidays. 
What are these agencies basing that budget on as towards the end of January, we are still on a continuing resolution from the past year? It inhibits effective planning. Uh, it again oscillates the flow of money. Uh, it wastes money towards the end because for many longer term agreements and contracts, uh, it inhibits people from making decisions. I'm convinced, and again, across all 12 bills, not so much for major contractors that do good work for this country, whether it's building roads or the Department of Defense, those scup contractors and those smaller businesses that don't have that financial wherewithal to wait until seven months into the year to see if there's going to be a contract. Mm -hmm. There's a whole range of things that are very upsetting and, again, uh, weaken weaken our ability to effectively govern and also, I am convinced, waste more money than some of our colleagues think we're saving in this process. I'm, I'm, the gentleman, Chairman, you know, just to comment, you know, whether you're running a Head Start program or a, a nutrition program for seniors or you're working on a, on a major defense contractor to provide stealth for aircraft, <laughs> you need some predictability. You need some stability for the government workforce as well as the, the, the private sector. And this is why we're pushing ahead here. I think we ought to push ahead on all 12 bills. And obviously, the constitutional responsibility is defense. But in the end, I want all 12 bills across the finish line. Thank you for yielding. The, well, I would ask you to share with me, Mr. Chairman. Again, I, I brag about your collective effort on the Appropriations Committee uh, at every uh, public meeting that, uh, that I have because we're not in the habit of, uh, of success. It's really, really hard uh, to do it. I was listening to some senators uh, talk the other day. They said there's just no time on the calendar to take up the House uh, uh, bundled appropriations bill. I'm thinking historically you had to take up 12 bills and then 12 conference reports. Historically there was room on the calendar for 24 different uh, bills, but for whatever reason we've gotten in the habit not even time for a, for a single bill these days. Every time we come down to the floor and vote for CR, uh, I go back home and say exactly what you all have said today, which is this is to provide us just a little bit more time so we can find that agreement. The only explanation I have about what's going to be different next time than last time, Mr. Chairman, is that the leadership that's required to cut this deal uh, has uh, obviously been focused on some other things uh, over the past uh, few weeks, and perhaps with, uh, with those things behind them, they will now be focused on issues that, that you and I care about. But, but what, from your perspective, uh, is going to be different about two weeks from now than, than, than two weeks ago. Well, I should hope we would have prevented a government shutdown, for one, mm -hmm. and we've got the money out the door to, to those areas where people have been suffering. Uh, the, the comment on uh, the Senate is a different institution in, in the House. I always say this, I guess this is live, the Senate can only address one issue at a time. We need to address multiple issues, and, uh, you know, I, we, we, the, the, our leadership tried to reestablish regular order this year. So we went through all 12 of our bills. It might have been a hellish path, but in reality, we, we, we worked together as Republicans and Democrats to get things done now 90 or 100 days ago. So I, I think we've established a pattern for the future, which we, we should follow. I can't speak to the Senate other than what I've said, which I think is pretty accurate. Thank you. The two... Uh, uh to, to make the gentleman from Indiana's point, the future is uh, the future is upon us uh, as those requests are rolling in the door uh, for next year, uh, uh, just uh, just around the corner. Well, uh, if I could just uh, say, Mr. Chairman, you mentioned the aggressive oversight that the committee uh, does, and in fact, uh, the gentleman from Indiana mentioned it in, in, in DOD as as well. No one should be immune from aggressive uh, uh, oversight, uh, and uh, often it's said that the responsibility of this chamber is to to appropriate uh, uh, dollars. It is rarely. Uh, or at least uh, not often enough, coupled with the responsibility of this institution is to appropriate those dollars and then to ensure that each and every one of those dollars is spent uh, as, uh, as responsibly uh, intended. Uh, you all have a lot on your, uh, on your plate. The continuing resolutions don't make that job any, uh, any easier. Uh, I hope your optimism that, uh, uh, that one more time uh, will be the last one more time that we have to come and, and visit about. And I, I do thank you both for your collaborative uh, work. It, uh, it, it, sets a, it sets a good model and it encourages uh, the men and women that I serve back home. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. The gentleman yields back his time. Thank you very much. The gentlewoman from New York. 
Thank you, Mr. Yes, Chairman and uh, gentlemen. I, we've heard this so many times that uh, this is the third CR that we've had this year, and you talked about uncertainty, uh, but you have to add the CHIP program, Child Health Insurance, uh, which expired September 30th, the Community Health Services expired September 30th, Planned Parenthood's money has been taken away from them, so everybody said the Community Health Services can take care of all that. Uh, this country's not working. Uh, it absolutely is not working, and uh, it's troublesome, I think, because of three CRs, and we know the uncertainty is awful. But I think the most important thing you wanted to do was what you did today. And I want to report to you that I just checked Dow Jones. Uh, they just closed 11 minutes ago. They're down 37 points. NASDAQ is down 31 points. S&P 8.69. Uh, you have time, I think, to keep that bill from going over the Senate and having them uh, work out tonight and sign it tomorrow. I don't know, this is not a good indication of what you're gonna get. But the, the continuing uh, resolutions, uh, we all hear it. We hear it in our districts all the time, when are you gonna help? I was, re I really, because I believe what everybody was telling me, told my community health center, one of them, which is spending an enormous amount of money expanding because they have to that their money was on the way, and it is not. And I, I really don't know whether they're going to shut, but I'm very much concerned in the middle of the flu season, which is awfully heavy this year, that children's insurance is not going to be dealt with. I, the Defense Department is critical that they know where they are. Uh, but as Pete pointed out, it's the same for all of them. But we really, we, we uh, as somebody said today, if, if you think what we're doing here is either Thomas Jefferson's manual or the quaint little thing about how a bill is passed. We, we're not even close. Uh, we, we're always in an emergency and we're trying to stop gap and maybe put a whole finger in the dike just trying to hold the water back. But this is really no way to run a government, not the United States of America. It's, it's pathetic. Uh, I think we're all depressed and shell-shocked and stressed out to death anyway. Uh, over the news every day, which comes at us with buckets full of bad news every minute. But let's, for heaven's sake, start a new year and get this over with. But this has really got to be done now. I understand the Senate is not going to take this bill. Am I right about that? Forty Democrats sent it or so to you that uh, they, this, if some things were not in this bill, they would not vote for them? Is that right? We do. Well, do we expect to see you back here on Friday or something? Uh, it's always fun to see you, Miss Slaughter. Well, whatever the circumstances. <laughs> now, that was pretty I, darn sincere. I hope only to see you once this week. That was pretty sincere. <laughs> no, I mean this. I mean, yeah, I took it. I, 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 well, I could sit up here forever. Oh. <laughs> but somebody's got to cook the Christmas cake. Um, but in any case, I, I'm, I'm, I'm really concerned about it. I, I, this democracy, I think, is in some peril. I think we're quickly losing our reputation in the rest of the world. We're being denigrated. We are no longer a reliable ally. So many things that we really need to be doing and need to be working on. But if we can't even do the budget, what use are we? So let's, for heaven's sake, stop embarrassing ourselves and everybody that sent us here and try to get something done. But you don't believe the Senate's going to pass this, do you? There's not that expectation, but uh, then I, what? Well, we'll see what Plan B is. I think we'll we, we need we do, need do to you get, have a get plan to come B? back. Well, we're we're well. I can't tell you we're preparing oh. other continuing resolutions, but Boy, we I have to look have, at those if I as were options. You, I'd have one. I, seriously, I'm, I mean that. We're, we're we're prepared, and we have a very professional staff, and we obviously uh, check our notes with. Uh, with uh, your, your side as well. Obviously, we, we have an obligation to keep the government open for business, and we, we have to meet these needs of people that are suffering from these disasters in horrendous circumstances, and we're, we're, we'll be pushing forward to make sure that's done as quickly as possible. Well, the last shutdown was, I think, 16 days. Is that right? Uh, $24 billion went out of this economy by shutting down all the federal facilities where the people who own the little newspaper shops, restaurants, and the federal buildings all had to close down. Uh, veterans 
facilities shutting down. We had five Nobel laureates working for the federal government at that time and laid off four of them. Uh, this is not new. I think we have been slipping here for a while in really how to operate this government. Um, and I, I really, I'm deadly serious here. I am, I'm very much concerned. Ms. Slaughter, yeah. I would simply say, and not to beat a dead horse, I'm playing the cars that were dealt today. And I would never speculate on politics, let alone the United States Senate or tomorrow. If there is a new set of cars tomorrow, we will all have but, to play them. But I would say that the chairman made an interesting point. No matter what the future holds tomorrow, uh, whether it's Thursday or Friday or some other future date, our staff will get the job done and do an exceptional job doing it and pull us through until that next date. It is a heck of a way to run the country to make them do I, that. And I would hope, getting back to the conversation yeah. with the gentleman from Georgia, is let's It's humiliating this. is what it is. It's really embarrassing. And, and in this committee, we talked about it last night, about the process for that bill we passed here today. There wasn't a Democrat fingerprint on any piece of that legislation. Uh, even when they went to the conference, it was decided before they even went to the conference and announced in the press what they were going to do. So obviously everybody on the conference knew that it was a sham. We got to stop that. Um, and, and certainly I'd sure like to see the process changed in here. Uh, we, but we do have smart people in this Congress. And we, I know we have dedicated people. We can do better than this. And I, if we don't have a plan, I sure hope you get one. Good luck. Gentlemen, goes back for time. Uh, gentlemen, I, I want to say both of you are handling a very difficult issue, and you, unfortunately, are not immune from hearing from members of Congress at the Rules Committee. But I hope that you know Justice Chairman Cole offered his uh, value-placed words. You know that we are struggling with you, not at you. And I hope you both recognize the difference in that. The gentleman from Texas. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> We've all been sitting here a long time. So in the interest of proper circulation, I have to stand up every so often <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and move around. Um, I don't state the obvious, but there, there clearly is a, a solution to this, and that solution does reside over the United States Senate and is with, within their power to end this. And I frankly don't understand why it hasn't happened, but um, there are some important things that we're considering today. And of course, <laughs> one of those things is the disaster assistance that you've capably put together, um, although. My area of the state of Texas was not directly affected. It did affect my state, and obviously I feel that very profoundly. As the chairman pointed out, I have made two trips to the island of Puerto Rico on behalf of the Energy and Commerce Committee because of the health concerns and the energy concerns that, uh, over which our committee has jurisdiction. And I will say that there was some improvement from the first time to the second time, but there is still a massive amount, a massive amount of work that, that needs to be done. I know uh, my own, uh, in my own state there, there are some who are concerned that this, uh, <clears throat> that this is not uh, going far enough, but I think, Mr. Chairman, and you alluded to this is our third, our, our third approach to this uh, disaster recovery. So there was the immediate replenishment of the, uh, of, the, of the FEMA disaster assistance funds, and then there was a secondary one that followed that, and this is now the third uh, look. And I am going to assume that because of the magnitude of the problems that we're up against, this is not the last time that we'll be visiting this. Is that correct? I think that's correct. I, I, certainly, I think uh, uh, Texas and Florida are going to have ongoing needs. But we don't have the, all the information we need from California, but if you're talking about hundreds of thousands of acres and, and people fighting those fires and the destruction of property largely 
uh, private, but I assume some public property. And then, as you mentioned, and, and uh, I had the opportunity to go down to the Speaker to Puerto Rico, 10 miles by 40 miles, there's a lot of misery down there. Potential for, you know, as a physician, uh, Zika virus, I mean, uh, uh, the lack of potable water. I mean, there are were infrastructures there to begin with, but uh, lives, human lives are at stake. Many lives have been lost. Uh, and I think uh, at some point in time, we're going to have to come back here again to uh, talk with this committee and consult with our colleagues as to what further we need to do to meet the needs of these uh, disaster victims. So um, <clears throat> let me just allude to the fact that you and I talked yesterday about the problem with the, uh, the federal match, the FMAP, the, the, the territorial share for Puerto Rico, and it uh, does represent a significant obstacle to them, and of course they've discussed that with me. My study of the situation after the storm called Katrina was that it took about a year to come up with the funding to offset the, uh, in this case, the state portion of the of that federal match in the state of Louisiana. Um, what I had forgotten in that equation, and you pointed out to me last night, that it does require an authorization. So I've taken that back to my committee. And in fact, you are correct. The authorization in between 2005 and 2006 came on the Deficit Reduction Act in, in, at the end of 2005, and the dollars then actually were made available to the state of Louisiana at the end of the fiscal year, uh, September of 2006. So I think that is, again, that's information that I'm taking back to my committee, and we will work on that, and I will, I will commit to you that we will get, uh, we will get that solved to the, to the limits of our ability. But I just want to encourage you, I mean, you guys have done a lot of work. We did a lot of work, Mr. Chairman, as far as delivering 12 appropriations bills before the end of the fiscal year. Uh, quite an accomplishment. It's been a long time since that has happened. As uh, Mr. Fikowski pointed out, it's not, you know, may not have been perfect, may not have been exactly the way you would have drawn it up if you'd had a free hand, but they were delivered. Um, we, do need, uh, we do need some movement on the other side of the rotunda, and it's just really as simple as that. And thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the time, and I'm going to yield back. Thank you very much, Dr. Burgess. The gentleman from Massachusetts. Yeah, well, again, let me, let me begin by saying that my opening rant was not aimed at either of you. Um, um, you have to deal with the cards that you're given. And, um, and I would argue that the numbers uh, that you're given, the budget numbers that you're given, you know, are, are inadequate for what the needs of this nation are. But I would just say to my colleague from Texas, um, who, you know, put all the blame on the Senate, um, I, I would, I would suggest that some of my friends um, on this side uh, look in the mirror. Uh, the bottom line is some of these unreasonable numbers that, uh, that uh, many in your conference insist on um, are non-starters. And I mean, if you want to keep the government running, I mean, you need, you need to be able to get numbers that can pass muster here, but also pass muster in the other body. Um, and um, you know, we've known where some of the difficulties are for some time. We've had these, we've talked about CHIP, you know, how the offsets are, are, uh, are, are put forward in the, in the CHIP program, you know, non-starters, and yet we, you know, we're in the same place over and over and over and over again. And um, I get it, you, get, you have to deal with some real hardline deficit hawks in the Freedom Caucus, uh, but after today's vote, after what they voted to add to the deficit today with this, uh, with this tax bill that benefits mostly corporations and people who are well off in this country, I think they should be a little bit humble. Um, and maybe now is the time to kind of come together and come up with numbers that can pass muster in the House and Senate, and let's, let's move forward. But, um, you know, that we come, we're at the brink again, um, you know, it's just, it's, just, it's just really frustrating. And, and again, I think you both said it, you know, this thing is going to, we're going to go through the motions here. The Senate's going to send something entirely different back to us, and we're going to have to deal with that. But, um, you know, moving forward, I, I, I think there needs to be some reflection on um, why there is so much difficulty. Uh, and, um, and, maybe, uh, and maybe some of the problem lies here in the House uh, with some of the numbers that are being proposed, which I think are totally unrealistic. And look, we all want to fund defense, but you know what? The national security of this country is about more than the defense budget. 
Um, and as you pointed out, Mr. Pesklowski, I mean, you know, we, we have people that need to be given a good education to be able to be able to, you know, to succeed in this country, even to get into the military. We need to support programs that provide our senior citizens security, you know, whether they're nutrition programs or housing programs. Those are all incredibly important. Um, and the idea that somehow that we're making a decision that they're not so important, um, I think is, is the wrong decision to make. But, uh, uh, you know, I, rather than, you know, pointing the finger and, and putting the entire blame on the other body, I would simply say that uh, I think this should be some soul searching, um, you know, uh, by the leadership of this house. And um, I wish you luck. You, will, you know, no, no need to belabor this point. We're going to go through the motions and deal with this tomorrow, and then we'll wait and see what the Senate does, and we'll be back here in the Rules Committee, hopefully only one more time. But again, I want you to know I, pre I admire and respect both of you and the work that you do and the appropriators, um, and you have to deal with what uh, what is given you. So uh, with that, I yield back. Jimmy yields back his time. Thank you very much. And I do appreciate the gentleman's clarification to make sure that both of our witnesses understand that this committee is appreciative of not only the work that you do, but the constraints that you both live under and that of your staff. And I appreciate the gentleman from Massachusetts taking time to make sure that our guests today do understand how important they are and that they're very valuable to the process, and we appreciate them enormously. So I want to thank you for doing that. The gentleman from Alabama. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to add my thanks to all of you and the committee. I've worked very hard. You produced a good bill in September. You produced a bill in September. Uh, the Senate's done nothing. Now, the Senate doesn't have to like what we do. They can pass their own version, if it's different with different numbers, and send it to a conference committee. We do conference committees. That's normal. So I don't think the fact that they don't like our numbers or somebody that doesn't like our numbers lets them off the hook from doing something. I really appreciate your inclusion of CHIP. The first CHIP program in the country was in Alabama. I was on the state school board when we adopted it. I'm a big believer in CHIP. It has helped lots of children in my state, continues to do so. Uh, our state is going to send out notices on December the 26th that the CHIP program is going to be ended. Mm. And it will start very soon. So because I love the CHIP program and I think it's important, I really appreciate that being included. I do want to talk about the CR, however, from a standpoint of defense. I do not consider it to be defense spending to be like any other spending we have in the government. It's a, it is the sine qua non, that, that which without not they're in the country. I have listened, as all of us in the Armed Services Committee have listened, to the Secretary of Defense, the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, all the heads of the services, and many other of our generals and admirals tell us that the CRs are directly impacting in a major way the readiness of our troops. We had two destroyer incidents this summer. I sat through classified briefings about what happened. I've read the report, and there is no question that our failure to provide money to them on the appropriate basis has impacted in a very negative way their readiness. In one of those hearings, we had the mother of one of the dead sailors. And to sit in the same room with that woman and have the vice chief of naval operations say that the continuing resolution funding of the Navy has caused them to have these readiness problems made me sick to my stomach. So before I left home, Mr. Chairman, I bought all my Christmas presents, I wrapped them, I put them under the tree, I hugged my wife and my kids, and I said I may not be home for Christmas. Because there are literally thousands and thousands of men and women in uniform in the United States who are not home for Christmas either. And we continue to let them down when we do these CRs. The fact that we're doing this CR is not the House's fault. It's the Senate's failure to do anything. And so, I like the fact that this bill at least does one thing beyond CHIP. It funds the defense of this country in a way we can go out and get the readiness our sailors and airmen and soldiers need through the end of this fiscal year. We should have done it in September. I know we didn't. But waiting one more day really does put them in harm's way. And so I want to thank you for that in this bill. I don't know what they're going to do with this over in the Senate. I never know what they're going to do with things over in the Senate, because it seems to me they don't know what they're going to do with things over in the Senate. 
but I want us to send it over there, and hopefully they will send something back, something, just about anything. And then we can, as reasonable people, see what we can do to find a way to reach an accommodation with them. So I thank you both. I thank the committee. But as I make my decision on this bill and perhaps other bills this week, I'm going to remember that mother, that dead sailor, because I don't have to look at any more mothers in the eyes after seeing something like that again. And I yield back. Appreciate the gentleman's comments. The uh, gentleman, distinguished gentleman from Florida. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, uh, in the interest of time, I uh, echo the sentiments of Mr. McGovern and the ranking member, Ms. Slaughter. Obviously, I, I thank our two friends. Uh, we know how hard they and their staff uh, work uh, to produce uh, a product, and we also know how the other body works. Uh, but I do want to make one observation. In all the years that I'm here, Democrats are, major are in the majority, are Republicans in the majority. We have a holiday syndrome uh, when it comes to legislating. And what we wind up doing is just before whatever the holiday is, it's just Christmas this time, but it was Thanksgiving before or the 4th of July or whenever it's a holiday, we seem um, uh, to have our, our legislative process hung to what is uh, happening. Let me help Mr. Byrne. The Senate is going to strip out the defense measure and send it back, and then we'll be back here uh, dealing with what we have to deal with. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman uh, yields back his time. The gentleman from the state of Washington, Mr. Newhouse. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And as a newest, one of the newest members of the Appropriations Committee, which I'm very pleased to be able to serve with a fine gentleman from New Jersey as our chairman, and Mr. Vespasi, at a fine uh, leader on the other side of the aisle, as long as as well as Dr. Cole, uh, lots of, lots of people to work with and look up to. I was very proud of being able to get all 12 appropriations bills across the finish line, th through the House representatives and over to the Senate. That, to me, this seems like normal. We do it every year, right? Uh, but that's not the case. This is the first time in a dozen years that that has been accomplished. But um, Due to the strong leadership in that committee, we were able to do that, and, that was, and, and that's something that we should be able to follow every single year. <clears throat> As has been said before, and not to throw our good colleagues from the other side of the dome uh, under the bus too many times, but the, that's where the frustration lies as far as I'm concerned. They have the vehicle that they need in order to get uh, these appropriations, this appropriation work done that they could send back to us. They've had it for 100 days, and here we are at this point before Christmas, as Mr. Hastings pointed out, finding ourselves in this particular spot where nobody wants to be. Uh, so it is frustrating. Even though we've had successes, it's frustrating that we are at this point. Um, uh, I, I'm hopeful that we can get this done in the next couple of days and do it in as, as responsible a way as, a way as possible. Certainly the defense of our country is primary responsibility that we must we must stand uh, respond to um, but at this point I'm, I'm just I just want to say uh, express my appreciation to the members of the appropriations committee for for doing the work necessary and uh, also express my frustration with our colleagues in the Senate and uh, my hope that we can get this done in a timely manner that uh, satisfies the needs of our country but uh, for now, Mr. Chairman, I'll yield back. Thank you very much. I appreciate your gentleman's support for the uh, gentlemen that are before us for this appropriations process. The gentleman from Colorado. Thank you very much. The gentleman does not seek time. The gentleman from Windsor, Colorado, Mr. Buck. The gentlewoman from the state of Wyoming. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, I uh, want to echo some things that my colleague from Alabama said. Um, there is a vast difference between the Department of Defense and all other government agencies. And um, when we force the Department of Defense to operate under a continuing resolution, we are putting our troops at increased risk. When we force the Department of Defense to operate in a way where they do not have reliable, dependable funding, particularly in a situation that we're in today where we're facing grave and growing threats, we are making the mission of our men and women in uniform harder. 
And what that means today, I, I'm interested that those on the other side of the aisle are sort of talking about this as though it's some kind of a game, that we're all playing a game, that somehow we're going to, you know, it's just a game that we're sending over to the Senate. You know, maybe it's that I haven't been here as long, but I do not believe the defense of this nation is a game. And for the House of Representatives to do the right thing, which is to say we are going to fund defense at the level it needs to be funded with an appropriations bill that is at the level that this committee, uh, with you know, uh, huge effort and work, already passed out, which is also, by the way, the level that the Senate, on a bipartisan basis, approved in the National Defense Authorization Act. That is our constitutional obligation. Now, we all in this body spend a lot of time frustrated about Senate rules. Um, but this is more than that. We, as we sit here this evening, the dysfunction in the United States Senate is putting America's security at risk. And you can say that as Republicans, that as Democrats. I'm stunned, frankly, that every Democrat in the United States Senate sent a letter over here basically saying they would rather shut down this government than fund the support of the troops and fund the military of this nation. That is appalling. So if it is in fact the case that your colleagues in the Senate on the Democrat side of the aisle are going to play a game, that is their game. But, but when we are in a situation where the train wreck that is the Senate right now, the absolute train wreck, their inability to get anything done, is making it easier for our adversaries to close the gap, is increasing the risk that our troops are facing as they work to keep us safe every day, the reality is the only people in this country, the only people on this planet who can protect the United States military, who can make sure they have the resources they need, are the people in this body, in the United States House of Representatives. And so this isn't a game where we say, we're going to sort of pull defense out and send it over there. This is, we are doing what is right for this nation. We are doing what is right for our men and women in uniform. And if it means that the Senate is going to play a game and send it back, we don't sort of throw our hands up and say, you know what, another continuing resolution, let's go again. We stand and we fight. And I mean that very seriously. We are the ones that are right now tasked with protecting the men and women in uniform, the men and women who are on the front lines defending us. Only us in this body can make sure they get the resources they need. And if the United States Senate wants to play games, if the Democrats in the Senate want to play games, that's their choice. But they're going to have to stand up and explain to the American people how it is they are not willing to support our men and women in uniform provide them with what they need to do to keep this nation safe. And I absolutely agree. We don't go home. I agree completely with Mr. Byrne. We pass this bill. We pass this CR. We pass this appropriations bill. And we stay here. And we get it right. Because the effectiveness and the reliability and the readiness and the ability of our troops to protect us depends upon that. So uh, I am very grateful for all of the work that you have both done. Uh, you've worked very hard on this. Mr. Vesklowski, I was very pleased to hear, in particular, your comments about the damage of a CR. Uh, and I am very proud of this bill. And uh, you can bet that the vast majority of the people of this nation know that funding the defense of this country is no game. And we certainly know it's no game. With that, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Are essential. Uh, you're, it was on. I was not speaking properly. Thank you, Judge Hastings. And I want you to know that we view that we have an important relationship with you. And you have not gotten frustrated with us today. You've accepted our feedback. I hope that whether it's Mr. McGovern or it's Ms. Cheney, that you take our feedback that we're with you. Most of all, at a time when our nation needs to see wise decision-making and cool heads, we want to offer our support for you. So thank you very much. The last thing I'd say is Mrs. Lowy uh, arrived a few minutes ago and was in my office, and she said, Pete's doing such a great job, I'm going to watch him on TV, so expect to get a report card on your activities, because I guarantee you she's got one on me too. So best of luck, thank you very much, and Godspeed. If you'll please remember we have an awesome stenographer here. Anything you brought in writing that will enable her, that will enable her to be prepared. All right, is there a 
further amendment that or amendments that need to be uh, provided Mr. with the knowledge that you and I both know that we're in the middle of a vote. I don't know whether to do it now. The gentleman would have to decide if he yeah. wants to do that no. now or when we're. I think there's, is there no time on the clock? So, yeah, we so should probably. 40 out. There's still 140 people. You, it's your, you tell me how much time you want. Uh, well, I don't need very long, but the, I'm sure the committee will have questions about my amendment, so we'll do it when we come back. Why, why don't we say this then? We're going to go ahead now and move down to the floor. We're going to vote, so we're going to be subject to the call of the chair, which means as. Literally, as soon as we finish on the floor, we'll come back. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. I just wanted to give you breaking news. Apparently, what we passed as the tax measure um, has violated some of the Senate rules, and the likelihood is that we're going to be here uh, uh, again tomorrow voting on the tax measure. Yes, sir. And so, in, in fact, thank you very much. That will need and, a new rule. Ma'am? The revote will need a new rule. It would need us back here probably, maybe, uh, let's see, I used to fill paper out. I don't mind getting them a little bit early, but how about if we said, if we decide to do this, probably at 8 o'clock. Mr. Chairman? If, if that's what happens here, we, we well, would I'm expect to get our work. If I could ask a question, Mr. Chairman? The Senate has not acted. This is a guess. Okay. If that happens, that would provide another opportunity for me to get some of my amendments in, right? Uh, equally, an equal opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right, we're, we're, I'll work on the rest yeah, of the members and, of the committee. And so what we're going to do is we're going to now uh, go down and vote, and subject to call the chair, we'll be back. I talked to Don.
Rules Committee come to order, and thank you very much. We've now uh, finished our vote. The uh, determination uh, of finalizing this CR uh, is based upon feedback that we've received from members of Congress uh, who, who have amendments, and we would then move directly to that first person. That would be the gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Polis, the gentleman's recognized, and I would say to you, as as always, uh, without objection, anything you brought in writing for our awesome stenographer would enable her to finish off the record properly. The gentleman's recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My uh, first amendment, amendment number two, uh, which I would say is just a one-page amendment, nice and easy to read. Uh, all it would do is it would reduce the defense spending to conform with President Trump's own budget. Uh, the House, as you may know, in the defense sending program, outspent President Trump on defense by $18 billion. That's $18 billion of taxpayer money that President Trump has not requested that House Republicans want to go above and beyond in spending. Um, I just want to point out how dangerous uh, the direction of these policies are for our deficit in debt. Uh, at the same time, uh, we're plunging our nature, de nation deeper into debt by passing a $1.5 trillion reduction in revenues, uh, you're also spending record amounts. Now, my bill doesn't address that completely, um, but what it does is it says, why don't we just go back to President Trump's own spending, spending levels? Uh, this might be the first time I've asked this committee to agree with President Trump, uh, and I hope that the committee does. Uh, I personally would support deeper cuts to defense. I've offered amendments on the floor, uh, some of which this committee has made in order as part of the appropriations process, to cut defense spending. But this particular amendment, I've never offered because uh, we have not had a chance since President Trump's request level has come in to do that. We are now seeking in the House of Representatives to pass a defense spending bill for the year. I think it's fair to give Republicans a chance to side with President Trump and Democrats the chance to save $18 billion on defense spending. The administration did not ask for this extra $18 billion uh, why, when there's so many other programs in need of even a fraction of that funding, did in the base bill Congress appropriate additional money above and beyond what the President asked? All deficit spending, every dollar of this $18 billion that I'm seeking to cut, is money that we don't have that adds directly to the deficit. Uh, that means if we were to allow this amendment in order and we were to pass uh, President Trump's uh, official request for military spending, the deficit would actually be $18 billion lower. So let's make this amendment in order so we can restore some sense of fiscal responsibility to this body, take a strong step towards reforming our priorities when it comes down to defense spending. And again, uh, this may be the first and perhaps the last time that I ask that the committee agree with President Trump uh, with regard to his budget request for defense which is $18 billion below the money that Congress is throwing uh, that the military and the commander in chief say they don't even need. My other amendment, Mr. Chairman, polis number three, would simply add the text of the DREAM Act to the continuing resolution. Uh, I have met with many DREAMers in my district, young people who are able to work legally because of DACA, now uh, that has been threatened by President Trump. I've made the commitment uh, to those young residents of my district that I will try to, at every opportunity, advance a permanent solution for them so they can live their lives and contribute to make our country even greater. Their students, their workers, their entrepreneurs, their are friends and their neighbors, their Val Victorians and their fast food employees. Most of them only know the United States is their home and they deserve to stay and contribute to their communities. My amendment, which is supported by Democrats and Republicans, and I'm confident would pass if we allow on the floor of the House, simply allows people who are able to work legally today to rest easier knowing that they're not in imminent danger of deportation to a country that they don't know and have never been to in their living memory. Americans of all stripes, majorities of Republicans, Democrats, Independents, all agree that dreamers need to be protected. Now is the time, Mr. Chairman, by simply allowing this amendment as part of the continuing resolution, I'm confident we have the votes on the floor to pass it so that we can guarantee that over one million aspiring Americans and indeed de facto Americans 
will have the chance to live and work in a country where their contributions are accepted and valued. I'm happy to yield for any questions. Thank you very much. Uh, the, um, the gentleman offered direct testimony that the Defense Department and the Secretary of Defense have said that they don't want or don't need the $18 billion. Is that what the gentleman said? This brings the funding level to President Trump's budget request that's for Department not my, of Defense. That's not my point. The gentleman said the $18 billion that they don't want and don't, that they don't want and they don't need. It, it, it's not the request of the Commander-in-Chief of the military. Uh, the Commander-in-Chief of the military, the President of the United States, has requested $18 billion less for the military. I'm sure you can find commanders of differing opinions with regards to the resources. But it's not military. testimony. You've not seen this. You, it's, that's your... You're looking at the president's budget. That's correct. The president's budget, who is the commander-in-chief of the military. OK. Mr. Byrne? Unfortunately, I might add, he's the commander-in-chief of the military, uh, from my perspective. It, you're entitled to an opinion, I'm sure. The gentleman from Alabama. After the House passed the increased amount, both in our NDAA and defense appropriations bill, the president said that is the number he wants. So the president's number is the number that we put in our bill. So you would be taking money that the commander in chief now says he does need to have, and the amount that the secretary of defense says he needs to have, and the amount the chairman of the joint chiefs of staff says he needs to have. So it's pretty clear the command structure says we need the money. Well, again, the president submitted a budget. Uh, in fact, our good friend and former colleague Mick, Mick Mulvaney was involved with that process. In that budget, there was a formal request yes, for I'm, a level I'm, of expenditures. I'm aware of it. I'm just telling you that the president's changed his mind, which he's entitled to do. Uh, well, I, again, the only budget request that they've given, as far as I know, they've never supplemented no, he's, that. He's made an official statement that he needs an increased amount, particularly in light of what's happened in North Korea. You know, and, and, I, and I certainly didn't indicate that the president would, would veto uh, a a uh, different amount, but the only budget request that we have received uh, is a spending level that's $18 billion well, left you're, on defense. You're, you're trying to convince us to support your amendment, mm -hmm. and I'm just telling you, you're trying to convince us based upon information that is dated and is no longer correct. Well, I'm not, a, I'm not aware, and perhaps the gentleman is, there, have there been any supplemental budget requests from the, the uh, president? As you know, this president sometimes gives us statements that aren't informal budget requests, and I've seen his statement about it. It's a pretty clear statement. He agrees with the number in the House pass NDAA and in the defense, which actually our defense appropriation bill was bigger because the president asked for more because he said we needed more to respond to the threats from North Korea and because we have some repairs we have to make to two destroyers that took some pretty serious damage as a result of these collisions. That is a result of our failure to give them proper funding through regular appropriations. Well, and I would just ask again, I, you know, if the gentleman opposes the amendment, at least we would vote to make it in order so we can have a debate about this on the floor. Uh, and I'm happy to present you know, the timeline of what the president proposed and, and what he said. Um, but again, uh, certainly presidents change their minds, but the only budget uh, request we have from them is at the level that I suggest in this amendment. I, I, I'm pretty familiar with the budget request. I'm pretty familiar with the fact that it's changed, and it's changed in the way that I explained to you. Ms. Cheney and I sit on the Armed Services Committee. This is the sort of thing we get to deal with all the time. Um, it, it has been a difficult year for the United States when it comes to dealing with national security issues. We have an incredible <laughs> ma uh, threat matrix that gets worse literally by the day. And so the president has to stay abreast of that, and it's normal for him to come, or any president come forward and say, we've got a new threat, and I've got to meet that threat. I need more money to do that. And we're responding to that when we listen to him, when we listen to Secretary Mattis, and we hear uh, General Dunford, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. I mean, if, if, if I thought that we could defend America for less money, I'd like to spend less money. But I know we cannot adequately defend this country for a dollar less than what's in that defense appropriation bill we passed through the House. We can't do it for a dollar less. You know, Mr. Chairman, and, and, and certainly we all are committed to defending the country. I know we all share commitment to the various programs that are funded by the federal government, and we wish that all the money in the world existed for them. I would argue, because the $18 billion of additional expenditures was not in the President's budget document, 
uh, if we are going to try to come up with $18 billion of additional spending, we can't just do it in isolation in this bill. Where is it coming from? It's a discussion about the broader government expenditures. Uh, if you do want to spend above and beyond that level, it's not in the President's budget. So uh, again, it's a fair discussion. I think giving the House of Representatives the ability to have an up or down vote uh, on this uh, expenditure level will be fine. And if we need, if you indicated, because of changing events, a contingency fund, a supplemental, let's also talk about where the $18 billion comes from. Um, rather than just automatically add it on to our deficit. Well, taking my time back, it comes from the Treasury of the United States of America, and there is far more in the Treasury of the United <laughs> States of America than the total of $700 billion needed to defend the country. So that's where the money's coming from. Now, your point would be, well, if we spend that amount of money on that, what's left for the other things that we want to do with what's in our Treasury? And as you know, Two-thirds of all the money that's spent by the federal government goes out through mandatory spending. You and I don't even get to vote on it. So we're really only talking about a third of the budget. And in truth, uh, the defense is, is a little over half that now. And so I know that that means that that constricts the amount of money that's left. I would say to you, sir, and I think this is something we ought to be debating as a House, there are over a trillion dollars in mandatory spending that is not Social Security, is not Medicare, is not TRICARE and is not the health benefits for our veterans. That extra trillion dollars we ought to be debating and talking about whether we should be spending that money at all in these, all these different programs, or should we be spending them at that level? If we did that, if we changed that, those programs from being mandatory to being discretionary, then you and I would have more latitude to be able to make the decisions that I think our citizens, our constituents, send us here to make. So I would say to you, the problem isn't with defense. The problem is with our inability to deal with mandatory programs and put Medicare and Social Security and all that stuff to the side. There's stuff in mandatory spending that I think you, if you saw it, would scratch your head and say, why is that mandatory? Well, and as the gentleman knows, I've, I've always been supportive of bipartisan discussions around mandatory spending. Uh, unfortunately, in this particular CR, the only year-long spending program is, is, is for defense and the military, which is why that we're talking about this particular $18 billion. So I'm in no way indicating that this $18 billion is the only money we should be talking about. Well, reclaiming about. my time, if we CR the rest of spending into next year, we're going to have a discussion about the rest of that spending next year. That's correct. And we could have that discussion. And, and I would like for us to do that not just for next year, for this, for this fiscal year. I'd like to have it for a very long time in this government because we've got to start making better decisions about where and how we're spending money. And so I would say to the gentleman, let's keep first things first, and defending this country is the first thing, and then talk about the other things and do it in a good faith fashion where we're talking with one another, not at one another. I'm tired of people talking at one another. I want to talk with one another and see if we can't come up with common sense, real understandings of what sort of compromise needed, need to be made to make this government function in a way that makes sense for the American people. I, I don't want to belabor this, Mr. Chairman, but I just want to make sure I push back on his facts and I yield back. Thank you very much. The uh, gentleman from Massachusetts. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to say I support making the gentleman's uh, both amendments in order. Um, and, um, you know, I, uh, I don't know what uh, President Trump's latest uh, view on military spending is. He changes his mind so many times, uh, uh, so often, that it's hard to keep up with it. Uh, for example, I remember there was a time when he said he wanted a tax reform package that uh, was geared primarily toward helping the middle class. And he ended up supporting a, uh, a, a tax package that where 83 percent of the tax breaks go to the top 1 percent wealthiest in this country. So he changed his mind on that. Um, and uh, so, um, you know, I have no problem with making the, the gentleman's amendment uh, in order and, and having that debate. And I especially uh, appreciate uh, his second amendment on the dreamers. I, I, for the life of me, I don't know what is holding things up uh, in this Congress in addressing the plight of these dreamers. These are people who came here when they were at a very young age. Some were infants. The only place they know is their home is here in the United States. They're law-abiding members of the community. That's one of the requirements for getting this protection. They have been through background checks. They have registered with the government. Um, there are 800,000 people, um, many of them uh, doing uh, incredible service uh, for our country. Some of them were, you know, leading the efforts in the hurricane uh, uh, relief efforts uh, 
that were going on in Texas and all over the, all over our country, um, and um, you know, um, and I agree with the gentleman that if we had an up or down vote on the Dream Act, it would pass. I know every Democrat would vote for it. And I know a chunk of Republicans would. Whether it's a majority of the Republican conference, I, I don't know. But enough, I know, to, to make sure that we could deal with this. Now, time runs out for these people in March. And already, some people, I think, are being put on notice that, um, you know, that their time is up. I mean, what a cruel and rotten thing to do to people. Well, the gentleman, uh, yield. Yield to the gentleman. Yeah, actually, 100, about 100 per dreamers per day uh, are expiring without the ability to renew. So it's already right. happening. And here's the deal. And this is a radical idea, I know, to propose in this particular House of Representatives under the uh, leadership uh, of this House. But bring, this is, a, this is an important issue, whether, you know, and bring it to the floor, debate it, and if you want to help protect the dreamers, vote yes. If you don't, then you vote no. But at least have the guts to deal with the issue. And so um, I, hope, I hope we have an opportunity uh, to vote on, on both the measures. Um, I'm not going to hold my breath. Uh, but, uh, but they're serious issues, and they deserve uh, to be discussed. So with that, I thank the gentleman. I yield back my time. The gentleman yields back his time. Thank you very much. The gentleman from Louisville, Texas, does not seek time. The gentleman from Florida does not. The gentleman supports. The gentleman yields back his time. Thank you very much. The gentleman from the state of Washington does not seek time. The gentlewoman from Wyoming does not seek time. Thank you very much. Is there any other member that would seek time? Okay, uh, the gentleman, Mr. McGovern, approached me and um, offered great advice. Uh, I came back with the uh, eight ball. And, and I, I, but I can't say that publicly. Uh, the, in some sense, we find ourselves today uh, several days away from trying to leave, get our work done, with dealing with several issues. One is this CR that we're dealing with, and I appreciate the gentleman, uh, his testimony today. Uh, and the second is the ability that we have to deal with evidently what has turned out to be as the Senate is deliberating on the tax bill, a provision that has drawn the uh, scrutiny of the parliamentarian that, that not everything resides within the what might be called a vertebral uh, uh, rule. To provide that, we might need to be back tomorrow. We don't know. Uh, we're now dealing with this here tonight. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to have us close the hearing right now, close the hearing portion, and then have us uh, leave subject to the call of the chair with the hope that that might be tomorrow morning. Based upon the things that happened with the Senate this evening, and I don't know if anybody has any more wisdom with the knowledge that uh, Mr. McGovern and I had a discussion along this line. It would be my preference that we will wait to hear from the Senate and then uh, provide information back uh, uh, through our staffs. Well, I, I think given the uncertainty, not only with the tax bill, but also with the continuing resolution, um, I know that you guys are still doing some whipping. I think uh, all that we would assume would be resolved by tomorrow morning. And so one, one would that, assume. That, that, that would be preferable, I think. And, and that, was, that was the right, recommendation that, that the gentleman there, uh, offered. I'm and that's chairman. That's what I'm trying to and I, I'd like, I'd like formalize the fact that you agree now. With me, yeah. Mr. Chairman, yes, sir. This is going to be a first for me. I agree with Mr. McGovern. <laughs> okay, you know let, let me I, see if we can. Uh, okay, I, 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 we should write this down as a red letter day. But um, I, it, we have enough uncertainty here. We have a lot of us have other things we could be doing. Well, if that's, we're going to that's come back more than anyway. Let's just come back and do it then. That's generally the point. I, I think that Mr. McGovern makes a point. I think the gentleman from Lower Alabama makes a point uh, that there would be time well spent in us uh, allowing time to find out what the Senate's going to do, rather than keeping people on alert here. So, good. So that we're aware. We are. Uh, this now ends the hearing portion. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. Excuse I, me. I, I just wanted to weigh in, Mr. Chairman, and ask. Um, 
more out of curiosity and also lack of knowledge, just what specifically uh, in the bird uh, <coughs> uh, provisions um, uh, were uh, are not uh, in that, 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 that were not in order as far as the parliamentarian is concerned. Was it the title? Was it revenue? Was it outlays? I, wish I knew. I will be honest with you. I've been focusing on trying to. Yeah, I just, I'm curious. Do I, this here. I, I, I don't know. And this is where I'm not even I have, suggesting that there is a problem. We had heard there is a problem. And so the evening would reveal that if, if in fact, it is true. Mr. Polis? Yeah, I, I, just, I just have an answer. I've just read it. Um, two provisions, uh, according to the Hill, usually a reliable source. Uh, one is I'm not so sure about that. Well, uh, maybe not. Yeah. But <laughs> <laughs> one, uh, one of them Can relates to. qualify. I, I no. I one. It, this is according to a, a one of them is tied to 529 accounts for homeschooling expenses pushed by Senator Cruz. The other is an exemption in the tax bill that would allow universities with fewer than 500 students from having to pay the endowment excise tax. So at least in this article, according to the Hill, those are the two provisions that were found non-compliant. Well, That's all I know. So it seems like that we have general agreement that if we close the hearing now, which I'm now preparing to do, that we would understand that we're trying to come back. Okay, so uh, we've now heard from all witnesses this close the hearing Mr. portion. Chair, I just yes, to make sure, did you say we're likely off or that we're off until tomorrow? I'm getting ready to oh, okay. say that right. we're suggesting we have agreement so now I'm moving forward and closing the hearing portion of the Senate Amendment to H.R. 1370. Okay, we've closed the hearing portion to the Senate Amendment. The committee now stands in subject to recess to the call of the chair. I do not expect us back tonight.